Previously on the British Broadcasting Century. December 20th, 1922, John Reith has accepted the job of general manager of this newfangled BBC. Along with his staff of three, they've just found an ideal premises on Savoy Hill. But it won't be ready for some months yet, so when they start work in the new year, they'll make do in a room at Magnet House on loan from General Electric. But while that deal's being finalised, on the Strand there's another house beginning with M, where the radio magic hasn't stopped since they started broadcasting in spring that year. The broadcasting continues from Marconi House. This time, it was the week before Christmas and all through Marconi House. Stanton Jeffries was on air, and so was his spouse. But who she? More later. Plus more memories and voices from those who were there in late December 1922 on the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is London Calling. Hello, hello. Paul Carenza calling here. Hopefully you're answering summer 2021 as I record this. But we're not interested in the rubbish old present day. We're interested in December the 20th to December the 24th, 1922 this week. Or actually a few weeks either side. We've got tales and voices from Marconi House when the BBC was just one month old. It's our story of British broadcasting's earliest moments. And we're telling it really one week at a time. This time we'll bring you up to Christmas Eve, even though it's summer here in 2021. You can't plan these things. This time we have our first couple of the BBC, maybe under the microphone or maybe under the mistletoe. So last few episodes, since the BBC's inception, it's been kind of Reith gets job, Burroughs teaches Reith about broadcasting. Burroughs, Reith and Lewis find premises and indeed an offer was made on those premises at Savoy Hill the day after scouting them. That's December 20th, 1922. That's the same day that Reith accepted the job offer of general manager. But doesn't all this still sound like the BBC hasn't really started yet? They're just getting a staff, they're just getting an HQ. But no, far from it. The broadcasting has continued ever since opening night on November the 14th and indeed months before it on an experimental level. Since May that year, the seventh floor of Marconi House on the Strand has been home to London's broadcasting. Here's one of the Marconi engineers who joined the BBC simply because he was moved by the Marconi company to Marconi House to help with London 2LO. But ultimately, he'd become chief engineer of the BBC. It's Harold Bishop, unrelated to the character on Neighbours who would marry Madge. I was a young engineer in the Marconi company and had been transferred from there Chelmsford Works to Marconi House in the Strand to help run 2LO, which was the transmitter which had been built by the Marconi Company on the top floor of Marconi House. All the programmes came from a very small studio, something like 23 feet by 18 feet, adjoining this transmitter room in Marconi House. Harold Bishop would describe the studio of 2LO as a padded cell because it was so draped with curtains. The studio began life as a cinema, showing in-house trading films to Marconi engineers. And in the pre-BBC days, the broadcasters and cinema operators would work around each other. But by now, December 1922, its use as a cinema was over. And in fact, Popular Wireless magazine was invited in to watch a programme being broadcast. The other evening, at the invitation of Mr Arthur Burroughs, who controls the operation of the big London broadcasting station, I made my way to the seventh floor of Marconi House on the Strand and spent a most interesting couple of hours behind the scenes at 2 LO. These words by journalist Michael Egan. In a thickly carpeted room, the walls, windows, doors and ceiling of which were heavily draped with white muslin, I took a seat among the half-dozen artists who were present and listened to the first song, a tenor solo, being delivered into the microphone. Oh, it was a unique experience. As I listened to the opening bars of the piano accompaniment, I could not help letting my imagination wander for a second or two. In my mind's eye, I saw the effect that was being produced simultaneously by these opening notes in thousands of homes throughout the country. I saw thousands of premonitory forefingers being raised and heard thousands of excited voices whisper, Hush! Keep quiet! He's off! Ah, the press make it sound so romantic, so magical. And then, as the first notes of the singer's voice poured into the microphone, I thought of the tuning and readjustment that must be going on. But if you worked there, well, newly appointed Deputy Director of Programme Cecil Lewis remembered it with a bit more brutal honesty. A dingy room, 20 feet square, with a faded green carpet, a grand piano, a worn-out settee with a horsehair coming through. A microphone of the type commonly used in public telephone boxes was suspended in front of each performer. Popular Wireless Magazine. 
The singer stood beside the grand piano, and at a distance of about a foot in front of him, the transmitting microphone was fitted on a tall pedestal. By sliding the microphone up or down a vertical arm, the necessary adjustment could be made to suit the height of each artist. A small switch fitted to the top of the pedestal enabled the transmitting power to be switched on or off as required. The transmitting apparatus is, of course, installed in a separate room, and during one of the three-minute intervals in the concert programme, I had an opportunity of visiting it. This room is on the same floor of the building, and the first thing I noticed on entering it was the powerful illumination provided by the lighted filaments of the transmitting valves. The room was literally a blaze of light. Returning to the concert hall before the three-minute interval was over, I found that a window and door in opposite walls had been opened in order to allow the members of the concert party to get a breath of fresh air. Owing to the extreme sensitivity of the transmitting microphones, it is necessary to keep all sound avenues closed whilst the concert is in progress. Moreover, for the same reason, it's impossible to use electric fans for ventilation purposes as the whirring sound of the vanes is able to affect the microphones appreciably. Cecil Lewis. The biggest joke of all, as it seems now, was that during the daytime, the studio itself was used as an office by my old friend Jeff, the station director, more officially known as Mr. Stanton Jeffries. Yes, there I sat while engineers tested microphones, a typist clicked away morning, noon and night, and streams of artists poured in begging for engagements. Ah, Stanton Jeffries, the go-to music maestro all summer long, swiftly appointed 2LO studio manager in the early BBC days, until he focused back on the music full-time as the BBC's first musical director when that department opened in the new year. Now hang on, let's hear those words again. There I sat while engineers tested microphones, a typist clicked away morning, noon and night, and streams of artists poured in begging for engagements. Uh, wait a moment, that was the same chap saying the same words but on a different occasion. Yes, there I sat while engineers tested Why microphones. such repetitions? Well, this was all for Leslie Bailey's show, Scrapbook for 1922, a real hit back in the day. But when they wanted to repeat it years later, well, the BBC didn't do repeats, even if they had the recordings. Repeats were cheating, surely. There was a genuine fear that listeners would feel robbed of that live feeling if they knew that they'd heard it before. And the irony is, I've told you this information on a previous episode, so this is a repeat as well. Feel cheated? Hmm, well, sorry, it feels relevant to go over again. So when the BBC wanted to rerun Scrapbook for 1922, they just got everyone back in again, apart from a few different guests, depending on availability, and they really got everyone to say exactly the same words as they said previously. Lazy repeats? Far from lazy here. Imagine the cast of Faulty Towers or Dad's Army replaying the exact episode over and over again whenever they showed it. Anyway, enough about the mechanics of the content. I did want to listen again to Stanton Jeffries for a very good reason. Streams of artists poured in begging for engagements. Blimmin' repeats. Well, what he doesn't say is that one of those artists already had an engagement from him because he'd married her. This was not mentioned in Scrapbook for 1922, even though both Mr. and Mrs. Jeffries appeared on the programme, because they were both broadcasters. 18 months earlier, in June 1921, Leonard Stanton Jeffries married Vivienne Chatterton, a singer that he'd met at the Royal College of Music. When Jeffries found a job with Arthur Burroughs at 2LO, he was providing musicians, and one of the first that he provided was his wife, Vivienne Chatterton. We mentioned a name briefly many episodes ago when we looked at the wireless exhibition. So yes, she was broadcasting from September 22 on an experimental level to demonstrate radio, sending her voice from Marconi House to the Royal Horticultural Hall where potential listeners in were being shown what radio could do. Top of Marconi House in a very tiny room hung with sort of white butter muslin. Here's Vivienne Chatterton chattering about when she was there. I remember strongly a set of bells, tubular bells, and a grand piano and a desk and a tele what looked to me like a telephone mouthpiece hanging from the ceiling. When Vivian Chatterton appeared on Desert Island Discs with Roy Plomley, she asked for Insect Repellent and the Dictionary of Musical Themes by Harold Barlow. Vivian Chatterton had a long career at the BBC, not as a department director or a manager like her husband, but as a popular singer and radio actress in the 20s, a star of films in the 1930s, and one of the earliest singers on the new BBC television service in 1937. She was noted for her skill with accents and voices, and in World War II she was a popular children's broadcaster. If you search for Vivian Chatterton on BBC Genome's website, she has hundreds, if not thousands, of appearances. Her first on the BBC was in Marconi House. 
Nearly five hours continuous wireless entertainment. On December the 22nd, 2LO issued a press release about their new expanded schedule just in time for Christmas. The programmes will open at 5pm each day in order to cater specially for invalids in hospital and children who retire to bed early. What they'd think of 24-hour programming for insomniacs, I do not know. More on the festive schedule was on our Christmas episode. I do recommend you go back and listen to that. But what was on on the 23rd of December is recapped here for you, condensed to just two minutes-ish. December the 23rd, it's the first 2LO Children's Hour at 5pm. Arthur Burroughs becomes Uncle Arthur. Uh, there's Uncle Caractacus, which is Cecil Lewis. Uncle Jeff is Stanton Jeffries. And it includes Simple Simon, Hickory Dickory Dock. But Vivienne Chatterton was there from the start, joining the radio uncles like her own husband, Uncle Jeff. In fact, she was the second voice ever on the London Children's Hour. Not an official radio auntie, though. The first of those would be Auntie Sophie from January 1923. Well, if you're the wife of an uncle, that surely makes you, even unofficially, an auntie, doesn't it? So can we christen her Auntie Vivienne 99 years later? That day is also the first appearance before a microphone of a celebrated actor or actress from a current London production. In other words, the first celebrity. At 6.45, the 2LO wireless orchestra returned by popular demand. Marconi's loaned the BBC the money for this. The cheque was signed by Stanton Jeffries, who worked at Marconi's, and he also sort of worked at the BBC, just not officially yet. At 7pm, the first general news bulletin and weather report. I waited to hear Mr Burroughs read the news bulletin, and I can vouch for the freshness of the information that it contained. Popular wireless magazine. Whilst he was reading some of the first items, a number of the later items were actually received over the phone and handed to him as he spoke into the broadcast microphone. Well, there is no doubt about the broadcasting company intending to let the public have its news hot. 7.15pm, London's first radio talk. Captain Towes, a visually impaired soldier, on Christmas Among the Blind. At 7.30, amusing stories. Great election day from Mr Pitt and a fisherman bold is told by Mr Marks. At 9.45, more from the orchestra and an entertainer, we'll read comedian, Fred Gibson. The other night I had to go and post a letter, but I hadn't got the stamp and found the GPO was young. There was one thing that everyone possessed. Enthusiasm. That master antidote for late hours and irregular meals. For Tuolo's programme maker-in-chief Arthur Burroughs, those late December days were among the busiest but the happiest, before the staff grew and others could take on some of his many jobs. I'm sure no one in this world could have had a happier time than we did at Tuolo during the several months of 1922, in which the station was tuning up for her more serious work. This from Arthur Burroughs' book. It's the second ever book on the subject, The Story of Broadcasting, from 1924. Our unseen audience, although only a few thousand strong, consisted in the main of wireless enthusiasts who understood our difficulties and who were always ready to give advice and sound criticism. They were a typical British sporting community, open-handed, highly appreciative of all our efforts, always ready to take their share in any development work in which they could play a part. One evening I opened the programme by reading lines from Longfellow, uh, within ten minutes, almost a record time for a trunk call over so great a distance, the telephone bell rang in the adjoining room. It was a message from the far side of Liverpool. Would Mr Burroughs like to know how much the 2 0 transmissions are appreciated at our fireside? If so, will he listen for a minute? We're going to place our telephone mouthpiece beside the loudspeaker on our mantelpiece. In less than 30 seconds, sitting in the neighbouring room to our studio in the Strand, London, I was able to overhear from this Lancashire fireside what was actually happening within three yards of me but out of earshot owing to the thickness of the wall. Hour after hour, letters rolled in from all parts of the country, a number of them distinctly humorous in character, others so strange as to leave one guessing about the mentality of their authors. There was the quite common case of persons complaining that broadcasting was injuring their health. One correspondent declared that she had seen birds drop dead in hundreds when flying in line with wireless waves. Then we also had visitors. One morning, a gentleman of position walked into my office and offered in all seriousness to pay the expenses of sending a message to Mars. We were unable to oblige, as he indicated that it was necessary that our wavelength should be raised for this particular message to 85,000 metres. To show the bona fides of his desire, he produced the typewritten text in what was stated to be the orthodox Martian language. So, Marconi House was getting busy. Artists here, there and everywhere and being used as an office by day. 
But as well as the artistes and the announcers and staff coming in in the new year, the press were invited in as well. Director of programmes Arthur Burroughs was an old press man himself. He knew how important it was to get the press on side. So not just in London, but to the Manchester and Birmingham stations as well, the journalists came into the studio. Mr Stanton Jeffries was full of enthusiasm for his musical work and expressed a conviction that broadcasting had come to stay in this country. Of course, the ones most interested were the trade mags, the wireless publications, like Popular Wireless Magazine, who wrote a full article in their December 23rd, 1922 edition. As the various items on the programme were performed, the modus operandi was as follows. At the close of each interval, the transmitting switch was closed, and a preliminary hello, addressed to the microphone by Mr Burroughs, who controlled operations, advised the engineer in charge of the transmitting gear in the distant room that the next item was about to commence, and the appearance of a small glowing light in one corner of the concert room signalised that the power had been switched on to the microphone circuit. The item was first announced, and the transmitting switch in the concert room was then opened again for a few seconds whilst the microphone was adjusted and the artistes made their final preparations for their turn. And then, in answer to a warning signal, silence was observed among those present, and as the transmitting switch was again closed... The opening chord of the accompaniment was struck. Near the piano were the famous chimes, operated by Mr L. Stanton Jeffries, the accompanist, who puts real soul into the work. In the middle of the room is a pedestal supporting the microphone, which is used by the announcer, as well as by singers. At one side of the concert room is a bracket which contains a tell-tale lamp, whose steady glow shows the announcer that the transmitter is working. This bracket also supports a pair of headphones, connected to a receiving set working on a small frame aerial in a distant part of the building. He is thus able to listen in and can signal to a singer to come nearer to the microphone or to move farther away from it. Thanks to our newspaper detective, Andrew Barker, for once again providing us with this. Then there's Amateur Wireless magazine. They also visited Tuolo Station for their December 23rd edition. Everyone knows the familiar words. Hello, hello, hello. Tuolo, the London Broadcasting Station calling. And most of us have tried at one time or another to imagine what sort of a place a big transmitting station must be. You can believe, therefore, how delighted I was when, the other day, the telephone brought an invitation to spend an evening at Marconi House with Mr A. R. Burroughs, the announcer, who up until then had been a voice but nothing more. The broadcasting room is on the seventh floor, but fortunately there is a lift. Imagine a mixture of a large drawing room, an office and a tent, and you have some idea of what 2LO looks like. The furniture consists of a grand piano, a number of comfortable chairs for the artists who are waiting their turns, music stands, a filing cabinet and a large desk. This was because Stanton Jeffries was using it as an office by day. Yes, there I sat while engineers tested microphones. Two microphones are used, connected in parallel. The second microphone is suspended from the raised lid of the grand piano in such a position that it catches the maximum volume of sound from that instrument. The effects of each artist, vocalist and instrumentalist are thus directed towards a separate microphone. The excited words of wireless journalists of the day of the magic of Marconi House. But let's have a more recent tale of a celebrity visiting a BBC building. Because, hey, we've not had an AM or an FM for quite some time. For an AM, you email us your airwave memories, like this from Sue Hawkins. Uh, Sue wrote, Probably my earliest memory of wireless entertainment was the archers when Grace Archer at Brookfield Farm died in a stable fire trying to save the horses. Perhaps 1952. There was a feast of programmes like The Goons, Journey into Space... Repeats of Much Binding in the Marsh with Arthur Askey and Stinker Murdoch, and Itmar, it's that man again. Paul Temple, Friday Night is Music Night, still going today. Oh, I nearly forgot, Sue says, Top of the Form, a schools-based quiz. Thank you, Sue. So do send us your AMs, your airwave memories in written form, or your FMs, your first-hand memories of seeing broadcasting in action. Uh, For that, we ask you for a voice memo, record it, send it to paul at paulcarenza.com, just like Poppy did. Now, Poppy runs a fab podcast at confessionsofaclosetromantic.com. Aww. And Poppy tells us a very honest, enlightening, and rather amusing tale of when she worked with the first goon, Michael Benteen. OK, so I worked at a, as a publicist for, at a big publishing house in London, and I was assigned to the Michael Benteen book. I think it was The Reluctant Jester, so this would have been like in the early 90s. Oh, how prophetic that title would become. <laughs> I was new and really green, and I'm pretty sure that's why I got the assignment after meeting him. So I put my all into it, but I really struggled to rouse 
any interest, even with his history of comedy in the UK. But in his defense, if you were anyone but John Grisham at the time, we struggled to book interviews for you. It was just that it was just that way. But I finally, I felt so proud of myself. I finally landed a BBC radio interview for him. It was not prestigious. It was not <laughs> it was not any of the big shows. It was some regional BBC station, but I thought at least I've got something for him, you know? His editor was going to go with me and we were going to escort him to the interview at BBC Broadcasting House. So we booked a tea at that really, I can't remember the name of it, that really fancy hotel right next door. The Langham. And let me just say, when I called this editor shy, she made the average woodland animal seem gregarious. I mean, she rarely spoke louder than a whisper. So I was like, I'm going to have to steer the ship, you know? So Michael Benting comes into the tea and he was sweet and funny as you can imagine. But obviously, immediately, he was a legend in his own mind. He was really difficult to handle as we had to handle authors at the time, you know, kind of nudging them gently, keeping track of time. Oh, he went on and held court. He was telling us every anecdote over the, under the sun. And I got more and more nervous because the time of the one little weensy interview of like 15 minutes was approaching. And I was like, Mr. Benteen, I think we should probably head over there. You know, it was just a few steps. He's like, no, we've got plenty of time. And he just started talking again. And we just sat there nodding. And I was getting more and more nervous. Okay, at least 15 minutes, a half hour goes by. Mr. Benteen, I really think we should go now. And he said, no, the BBC knows me. It won't be any problem at all. And just kept talking. Finally, I was just like, you know what? I don't know what else to say to this guy. He finally stopped talking. We finally stood up, walked over to BBC Broadcasting House. Not only did the BBC not care, which was pretty sad, but they did not care or hold the slot for him. He had completely missed his one interview I managed to schedule for this UK comedy legend. Okay, and there was no chance of a reschedule. I called them and tried later. Nope, not interested. So basically, his one chance to publicize his book, gone. And I didn't have the heart to tell him. He had just spent like two hours over tea publicizing his book to his editor and his publicist. And that would probably be it for his book. Thank you, Poppy. What a tale, poor Mr. Benteen. If you have an FM, a first-hand memory to share with us, record it as a voice memo email to paul at paulcarenza.com. That email address is in the show notes. Now, back in 1922, celebrities of the day weren't just on air. Celebs were being canvassed for their opinion on this new broadcasting craze. Popular wireless magazine contacted George Bernard Shaw and the actress Dame Sybil Thorndike for their opinions on the use for these airwaves. And they both had axes to grind. Dear sir, the only suggestion I can make with regard to broadcasting is it will be a most excellent thing if it were to be well rubbed in by radio the fact that we want a national theatre. If that could be repeated, say, 50 times during each programme, it might be a great public benefit. Yours faithfully, Sybil Thorndike. And this correspondence from Mr George Bernard Shaw. Sir, I suggest getting Sir Johnston Forbes Robertson to speak good English to them every day for half an hour to give them some notion of their own language. That would be a startling novelty to most of the subscribers. George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw would return to the airwaves some years later. Well, were we to dart around the wavelengths on December the 23rd, 2ZY Manchester had Handel's Messiah and Ghost Stories for Christmas. Birmingham 5IT were finding their concerts popular in the countryside. Listening in parties were hosted. You'd bring the neighbours round, dance to those radio sounds over the Christmas period. And up in the northeast on December the 23rd, a new voice. The first rumblings of radio in Newcastle. 5NO was the first station to be built by Marconi's since the BBC had been set up. And this station had been promised to be on air by Christmas Eve. But there were delays. So, would they make it in time? 
Next episode, the story of December the 23rd to the 29th in the Northeast as Newcastle 5NO becomes our fourth BBC station and the first to be built from scratch under the BBC. And trust me, it's a bizarre, brilliant tale. And appropriately, because it was Christmas, it's a radio station birthed in a stable yard on the back of a lorry. Holidays are coming. For more on the Christmas broadcasting of December 1922, you can go back to our Christmas special. It was episode 20. But before we go ho-ho, uh, some thank yous. This has been a real jigsaw of an episode to make. I could not list all the resources that I've drawn on to pull this one together. It's not all in one place or in one book that I'm just kind of reading out. But the major players that I've drawn on for this one have been Brian Hennessy's book, Emergence of Broadcasting in Britain, um, Asa Briggs' a Birth of Broadcasting, audio snippets from Leslie Bailey's Amazing Scrapbook for 1922 and other programmes, Tim Wonder's Amazing Books and Research, Andrew Barker and Alan Stafford's Newspaper Trawling, Paul Hayes has pointed me towards some words, so many more as well. I do feel like I'm the conductor, and all of these and more amazing writers, broadcasters, historians, living and long since gone, all of you are the orchestra members playing this magnificent tune that is the story of radio. So thank you, whether you hear this or whether you are a distant voice in the ether, long gone by now. But there's a role for the audience as well, of course. We're not all playing that tune, some are just hearing this story. But of course, what do audiences do? They buy tickets for things. What I mean is, all of this research, these books, the web hosting, the time and trouble, thank you if you are chipping in and helping us out. Or if you have, or if you will, you can do so at coffee.com, that's ko-fi.com slash Paul Carenza, like Chris Sands did recently. Thank you, Chris. Or there's the more regular option on Patreon, where you could join our current crop of cracking contributors. Currently stand at Brandon Stansbury, Michelle Gersick, Adam Wynne Stanley, Timothy Witten, Matt Lacey, Zephyr Chick, Keith Marsh, Andrew Deacon, Alan Evans, Russ Anderson, Anne-Marie Tuck, Sarah McCarthy, Sarah Nord Mewis, Mark Loveday, who I saw last week, hello Mark, Dave and Jackie, Andrew Barker, Chris Tandro, David Jervis, and no relation, I believe, Andrew Jervis. What a gang! If you can join them, help us out, patreon.com slash Paul Carenza. I upload other things there, videos with our guests, the British Broadcasting Century Book Club, where we're currently reading Broadcasting From Within by Cecil Lewis, who you've heard elsewhere in this episode, that first deputy director of programmes. A worn-out settee with a horsehair coming through. His book Broadcasting From Within is now delightfully in the public domain, so I'm reading that piece by piece on Patreon. The other way you can help out for free is to share this episode on Facebook and Twitter, and you can join our pages on those as well. You could review this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get it. Thank you so much to those who have. We're still all five stars. Amazing. And I didn't write any of them, promise. But because I'm an old romantic, let's close this episode by reuniting the first couple of the BBC. Leonard Stanton Jeffries and Vivienne Chatterton, married for 40 years. They would announce and sing on the month-old BBC 99 years ago. Even on the Scrapbook for 1922 programme decades later, it was never mentioned that they were married and their clips were separate in the show. So from that programme, let's bring their voices back together for the first time in living memory. Stanton Jeffries and Vivienne Chatterton. There I sat, top of Marconi House, in a very tiny room. And streams of artists hung with white butter muslin. Poured in, begging for engagement. Yes? I remember strongly a set of bells. The British Broadcasting Century is presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. Original music is composed by Will Farmer. Archive clips are either public domain, being over 50 years old, or someone else's domain, possibly Leslie Bailey's, or a mystery person. The bits that are the BBC's are used with kind permission, BBC copyright content reproduced courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation. All rights reserved. All right? It's reserved. Thank you. Stay informed, educated and entertained. And join us next time on the British Broadcasting Century.